Hello to our Pleasant Green Church family and all of our listeners and believers who uh, keep pace with us as we indulge and delve into our Sunday School lessons from the Faith Pathway Study Guide. Uh, This is Lesson 12 for May the 23rd, 2021, from Unit 3, which is titled, Courageous Prophets of Change. And our lesson for today is entitled, Take Responsibility. Our devotional reading is Psalm 147. Our background scripture is Ezekiel, the 18th chapter. And our printed passage is from the book of Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 9, and also concluding with verses 30 through 32. And our key verse, I will be reading the NIV version. And the key verse is Ezekiel 18, verse 4. And it says, Everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins is the one who will die. Our lesson's aims are examine behavior in which we blame others as the cause. Commit to being responsible for your own behavior. And engage in responsible behavior that finds favor with God. And uh, our lesson is also again in three parts. And the first part is personal accountability. And our second section is personal integrity and our concluding part is personal responsibility personal responsibility and I just intend to hit a few points Uh, the lesson pretty much speaks for itself The introduction is interesting because uh, it somewhat uh, titles the sum conclusion of our lesson as the blame game. And then it uh, breaks it into categories and it says when we participate in the blame game. We are usually found blaming something or someone else for our outcomes or consequences. We blame one's self for everything. And we blame God or fate for what happens. And uh, it highlights... uh, Uh, some of the uh, fallacies of our behavior and our conduct uh, when we cannot own up to the actions and the behavior of ourselves which lead us into the consequences thereof. Now, A couple of points that we want to highlight. First of all is uh, we learned that uh, Ezekiel, during this transition of uh, being uh, carried away from Judah to Babylon, 
we learned that Ezekiel was in the process of being trained or entering into the priesthood in Judah during the time of exile and was an understudy of Jeremiah and Daniel. So we find that Ezekiel is a upcoming minister in the priesthood that he's studying uh, from the works of Jeremiah and Daniel. And the timing was while they were being exiled out of Judah and they were experiencing the defeat and the crushing of their people by a foreign enemy. And in comparison to the mission that was placed upon Ezekiel, we have a distinction because the text tells us that uh, there were false prophets, although Ezekiel was commissioned to prophesy what God had placed upon Ezekiel's spirit to do. At the same time, there were false prophets, and they were telling the people what they wanted to hear. And the people were being deported from Judah, uh, they were uh, being uh, controlled by a foreigner, uh, a people who had no respect uh, for their culture, for their belief, for their way of life, for their God. And so it rendered the people vulnerable to hear of relief. And there emerged false prophets who were telling the people that, hey, you're going to return to your homeland. It's going to be a speedy recovery. It's getting ready to happen shortly. Uh, don't be depressed and don't be bogged down. We're getting ready to get it all back. And the people were joyous, although in their silent moments, they had to realize uh, the dilemma that they saw themselves in. Yet it sound good and it was soothing to hear that it's getting ready to be all over. Yet, in contradiction to this, the false prophets had their own message and their own purpose for their teachings. But Ezekiel was commissioned by God to deliver a different message. And this message was not readily received because this message said it required some personal changes, some personal obedience and accountability. It required that... Um, of course, yes, we have been deported, and yes, we have lost our national status, uh, but um, there's some things that you need to do before we can think about being restored. There's some things that you need to change about your behavior, your attitude, your character, your ways. See, um, we can't be questioning God about why is God delaying and why is God not doing what God promised when we are not fulfilling what we said we would do and what it is we know we should do. And so Ezekiel's message, though sent from God, didn't get the same reception as it is many times when we are challenged 
and told that uh, in the process, yes, uh, God will deliver, but in the process, uh, there's some things that you need to do to make sure that you are ready for the deliverance. And so uh, we wanted to lift that. Another thing that we want to uh, bring focus to is the contrast. See, the false prophets had their own agenda and their own scripts. But what God gave Ezekiel, it became script. But it was delivered first in spirit from God to Ezekiel. See, Ezekiel didn't have a prepared script. Ezekiel didn't have a prepared agenda. Ezekiel's words that were spoken were delivered into the spirit of Ezekiel by the spirit, by God and commissioned by God. And then because Ezekiel spoke what was uttered into Ezekiel's spirit by the spirit, it then became scripture. And now we read it as though Ezekiel was reading a text to us when in truth, Ezekiel was speaking the utterance of God to us and then it became scripture. We need to give focus and recognition to that. Now, now our lesson uh, focuses on a tactic um, that is used, unfortunately, uh, by people to somewhat uh, in a manner which is like trying to checkmate God. So listen to uh, verse 2. It says, What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For everyone belongs to me, the parent as well as the child. Both alike belong to me. The one who sins, though, is the one who will die. Now, you know, you have to have a lot of nerve to quote scripture to God as though now we have cornered you and now we have you trapped with your own words. So here... In the book of Ezekiel, the text is telling us that as surely as I live, you will no longer use this proverb in Israel. This excuse you will no longer have. Uh, you will no longer hide your behavior behind the screen of blame and then say, well, I think it's unfair because, you know, our parents uh, sinned. Our parents, uh, they, uh, they weren't right. Uh, our parents, you even said it in your own word that our parents uh, ate sour grapes. They 
they partook of that which was not fruitful, uh, which was not nurturing, uh, which was not beneficial. And as a result, uh, we became their offspring. And so it, the text says that uh, our teeth were set on edge. Uh, we, we became the results of their actions. And you acknowledge that yourself. And you even said in your word that uh, this sin of our parents was, was being passed from uh, one generation to the next generation. So then how could you hold us accountable for what we've done and what we're doing when you already said that you knew this was going to happen. And the outcome of that is just so obvious. But if we really want to understand uh, the commentary in the text gives us some references, but we really need to read them in fullness. Because from Exodus 20 and 5, from Exodus 34, 6 and 7, from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5 and 9, when we read above those verses and below those verses, we find out that even though God acknowledged the sin of our foreparents, at the same time, God also made long-suffering, made grace, made guidance, made spirit available to us, even through the acknowledgement of what our parents had done. And so at the same time, God was aware of the fact that, okay, this has created like a cancer. This has been like a bad apple that was placed in the barrel and it contaminated the other apples that were there. But I'm still going to be present and I will still make my spirit and make my grace and my mercy and make my redemption available if they seek me. And so when we come into our next section, then it tells us that suppose there is a righteous man who does what is just and right. He does not eat at the mountain shrines. He doesn't look at the idols of Israel. He doesn't participate in behavior that he knows is not suitable unto God. He doesn't uh, participate and then assign blame. So he doesn't worship things that are not worthy of worship, but then use it and participate anyway, and then say, well, you know, it was my fathers that did this. You know, it was my parents that taught me this. And I am aware that it's not right. I also recall how uh, my parents didn't live to the fullness of life. We we encountered some hard times. I mean, things were difficult and stuff, and it wasn't always, you know, a good family environment in the home. And so I recognized, I experienced, I learned uh, what disobedience could do. But at the same time, it was also convenient for me to kind of like do my own thing and then hide behind the fact that I could blame it on my parents. But the second part of the text says that this man that was righteous, that he didn't participate in things that he knew was not beneficial and fruitful to him. That he did not defile, devile his, his neighbor's wife. That he didn't participate and engage in relations with the woman when she was doing her uh, period, her menstruation session, that 
he didn't oppress anyone that he returned what he took in a pledge for a loan, that he didn't commit robbery, that he didn't give uh, food. He did give food to the hungry, and he provided clothing for the naked. So right at the same time where others were committing things that were unjust, it talks about the behavior and the results of one who practices that which is just. And I think that it is high time uh, for us to end the constant preoccupation with sin, 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 sin. Especially when scripture, which we will read, especially when scripture says that because of Christ, we've been freed from sin. It says that the first Adam was a living soul. But the second Adam was a life giving spirit. But I think we are preoccupied with always focusing on what the first Adam did because after all, isn't that a great opportunity for us to cast blame again on something or someone else? And so, when we look at it, we love to quote, uh, quote this, which is also a part of our stagnation and our constant preoccupation with sin. We love to quote this scripture. And many times when you say it, you don't even have to recite it because it's ingrained in everyone's memory. But as soon as we say, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then we always like to stop it right there. Because that keeps us engaged, right? Right? You can't really point your finger at me without me telling you. You know what the scripture says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So while you pointing your finger at me, look at the ones that are pointing back at you. And then that keeps us all engaged. Right. So then it's like, well, you know, uh, I've sinned. You've sinned. We've all sinned. But the scripture gives us a past tense. But we keep acting like the past tense is still present and it has futuristic reach. But it didn't it say for all have sinned? Does that mean... I'm just saying, in the English uh, literature, uh, English language, does that mean like that was past? And then, why is it that if we don't read the 24th verse, which says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ? So another passage we love to quote is, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But if we're still stuck on all have sinned, are we truly redeemed? And can we say so? The scripture says, it goes on now, it says, when God set as propitiation 
by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. And then it goes on to say, before, since you have been justified and you have been redeemed, before you start bragging about it, before you start trying to exalt yourself, before you start trying to exempt yourself from the practices which once constrained you, it says, where is boasting then? Can you boast? Can we boast in our own strength? It says, boasting is excluded. It, see, this, these are the verses that come after Romans 3.23. It says, boasting is excluded. And then it raises a question. It says, by what? Law or works? By what? Law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of law. Now, it was given us contrast about a just and a righteous man. And it says here in Romans 3 and 28, therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith faith apart from the deeds of law and when we think about it uh, the the eighth chapter of Romans talks to us about the difference between law and spirit and it talks to us on this wise, and it says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit, not the law of man, not the law of government, not the dictates of of religious dogma and traditions established by man, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus was made free from the law of sin and death. Are we free? Do you feel free from the law of sin and death? It says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. And then it says he condemned sin in the flesh. So we should not have this continuation in the constraints and the hold of sin. Imagine how far we would be and who we would be and where we would be 
if we did not continue to give the attention that we do to the issue of sin over and over and over and over again. What would happen if we gave the same inference, the same fervor, and the same occupation to the righteousness of God and to the manifestation of the righteousness of God in ourselves. What would it be like if we talked about the transforming power of the Spirit of God as much as we talk about the sin nature of Adam. As of one other point I want to make, and that's this. We know that Scripture teaches us that in the beginning, God breathed into the uh, nostrils of man. God breathed into man. And man became a living soul. In the 139th Psalm, in verses 13 and 14, it tells us this. Verse 13 of the 139th num number of Psalm, it says, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully, fearfully translated means reverently and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. So we have to recognize, honor, and give the proper credit and recognition to the God that created us. When God said, he looked at everything that he had done and he saw that it was good. We even know that from the fall of man, it was not from something internal. It was not from something within. God breathed into man, and man became a living soul. God formed our inner being. What caused man to fall came from outside. It was external, but not internal. When we think about this, I want us to look along, along these lines because this whole issue of sin is about subjective and objective principles. And it's the subjective that was breathed into us. When we look up the description or the definition of subjectivity, it, it is defined as relating to the essential being of that which has substance, qualities, attributes, and or relations. Are we related to the source of our being? Are we manifesting the substance, the qualities, and the attributes 
of the spirit that created us, reverently and wonderfully made? Or are we focusing on objectivity? Subjectivity is eternal. It's based upon matter and consciousness. We call it spirit. But objectivity is based upon things that are external, not internal, but external. It was something outside of Adam that subtly suggested to him to do that which was ungodly, being disobedient. It was something that was an object. It was something that was external that got Adam's attention. But what got his attention was not internal. It didn't come from within. It came from without. And those same subtle suggestions are being offered wholesale today in all types of venues. Take your pick. There is much that we could that we could continue to engage and delve into in this lesson. But in the closing of it, it it tells us, therefore, you Israelites, therefore, you people of the day, I will judge each of you according to your own ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent, turn away from all your offenses, then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. Behold, I make all things new. Why will you die, people of Israel? For I take no pleasure. God has doesn't get any joy, excitement, or any kind of reward out of watching his creation be destroyed. I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent and live. God, the Spirit of God does not say repent and live because it's impossible. Because the spirit knows what it breathed into us. It knows it made us capable of doing what it would require. It's up to us to choose to turn away. And if we can find reason of fault to blame God for not delivering us, for not moving quickly enough, for not being attentive enough. Maybe it helps if we understand what delays us from taking the actions that we need to take in obedience over our own lives. I hope that something was said. Um, I wrote notes and things to expound upon other uh, issues, but was not just led to bring those out. But I trust that what was said will bless those that hear it. And as always, our prayer is that we will not just be hearers of the word of God, but doers as well. God bless you and God keep you.